Welcome everybody to lecture nine, infinite products of holomorphic functions. In lecture eight, we studied a series of, mer of meromorphic functions. And in this uh, lecture, we want to go from uh, infinite sums to infinite products. And here we will uh, focus mainly on holomorphic functions, so meromorphic functions without poles. Although we will see when we treat the gamma function that we will also um, stumble upon some very interesting meromorphic uh, functions. So what is the, the problem we want to study? The problem is to give sense to infinite products of holomorphic functions. So let's start with the a sequence of holomorphic functions on some open set U. And let's suppose that none of this function is um, identically zero. And we ask, when is the infinite product defined with this symbol, from zero to infinity gn. So this is uh, simply g0 times g1 times g2 and so on. So when is this infinite product well defined and holomorphic on you? So last time we asked something similar for infinite series. We had a sequence of uh, meromorphic functions and we wanted to know when the, the sum of these meromorphic functions was uh, meromorphic. And also we, we could also give a formula for the derivative of this function. And today we will see analogous um, property for products. And actually the idea is to go back to the to the infinite series. How are we going to do this? So what we want to do, we want to transform the product in a sum. And how are we going to do this? So if you remember the properties of the logarithm, this is exactly what the, the logarithm does. So we will use it using the logarithm. And here we will take the principal branch of the logarithm defined on the old C without negative real axis. No? So this is what we, what we want to do. And uh, using this idea, we can give a definition of what it means to uh, converge uniformly on compact sets. And we will see that this condition will be enough to ensure the well-definedness of the infinite product. So let me give this definition. So we take Gn holomorphic on U such that they are not identically zero. Then we say that this product converges uniformly on compact sets if for all k in u compact there exists some n0 bigger or equal than zero this as usual depend on k what do we want so the first thing that we want is that we can take the logarithm of gn but for this to be true we want that uh, Gn uh, sends k inside the domain of the logarithm. Otherwise, we cannot take the logarithm of this uh, function. So the first condition that we want is that for all n big or equal than n0, Gn sends k to a subset of the domain of the logarithm. So this is the first thing. Then when this is uh, achieved, we can take the logarithm of Gn. And now we want that uh, if we consider the infinite series for n now going from zero and zero to infinity, this must converge uniformly on k. 
Okay, so this is uh, the definition. So you, you maybe you can try to compare this definition with the definition we gave in the last lecture about uniform convergence on compact sets for series of meromorphic uh, functions. And um, the first thing we want to show is that this is a good definition since if we have uh, this type of convergence, then uh, uh, actually the infinite product is well defined and it's holomorphic. So let me state the theorem, Gn holomorphic on u, not identically zero. And let's suppose that this product converges, converges uniformly on compact sets, then what happens is that for all, for all Z in U, the infinite product is well-defined. We let's call it F of Z. This is the, the limit of the finite products. So as uh, the infinite series is the limit of the finite, uh, seri uh, finite sums, in the same way, an infinite product will be the limit of uh, the finite products from and going from zero to M. And so we get a function in this way. And we want to show that also this function is holomorphic. Then also interesting to say something about the derivative of this function. And we have here a nice uh, formula. And uh, what we can do is to say something about F prime divided by F. This will be a meromorphic function because um, F is holomorphic. So F prime divided by F will be a meromorphic function. This meromorphic function is actually an infinite series of the meromorphic functions given by Gn prime over Gn. Not only that, we can also say something about the zeros of uh, F, the set of zeros. This will be just the union of the set of zeros of the G ends. Okay, this last property is uh, kind of clear because if you have a finite product, you know that the finite product is zero when one of the um, factors is zero. And what we are saying here is the same holds for this infinite uh, product. So very good. So this is the statement of the uh, theorem. Let's prove it. So what we have to, um, to do, we fix K in U compact. And then we know by hypothesis that um, there exists N zero such that uh, Gn of K is contained in C uh, minus, uh, minus infinity zero. And uh, uh, what we know is that if we define HM to be the sum from N going to zero to M of the logarithm of GN, then this sequence converges uniformly on K. Converges uh, uniformly. on K to uh, H, this uh, function, which is then the infinite sums logarithm of Gn. Then by what we saw uh, in lecture uh, eight, by lecture eight, uh, H is holomorphic and uh, the other thing is that the, the derivative of H is the sum of the derivatives the 
sum of the derivatives of the um, summons. So now I have to take the derivative of the logarithm of Gn, and for this we can just take the uh, chain rule. And this is exactly Gn prime over Gn. So very good. So we have this uh, function h, and we know the, uh, the derivative, and this function is, um, is uh, uh, holomorphic on uh, k. So here for, uh, for k, as in the case of infinite um, series, you can, for example, take uh, um, the closure of, uh, of some disk. Now, so then we know that the function h will be holomorphic in the in interior of the disk. Okay, so now what, why is this uh, function h uh, important? So let's go back to our product. So, um, our product was the product from zero to M of GN. So this is the finite product and we want to show that this converges. Now what we can do, we have this N zero, we can take the product from zero to N zero minus one of GN, and then we can take the product of uh, GN from N zero to M. Very good, but now let's uh, observe that this uh, second part is just the exponential of H to the M. Okay, so this is um, easy to see. Let's take just the exponential of this uh, H to the M, which is this sum. And you see that um, you will get the uh, product of all the GNs. This you can uh, easily uh, check. Now we can take the limit for M going to infinity. So this means that exists F, which is the limit as M goes to infinity of the product of all the GN, so we, we show that we can split the product in, the, uh, in these two parts here. So we uh, can write this as first the product from zero to N zero minus one of the GNs. And then we have uh, the limit for M going to infinity of E to the H M. But now we know that HM is converging to H. So uh, you see in the limit, we get this uh, formula, E to the, uh, to the H, because the exponential is, uh, um, is a continuous function. So we can bring the limit inside. Very good. So we, sh we showed then the existence of the um, limit of the finite products. The limit exists and is given here, you see, by this uh, formula. Then when we see this formula, we have a product of a finite numbers of GNs and the product with E to the H, and these are all holomorphic functions. So these are, is a product of holomorphic functions because now H is holomorphic, so the exponential of H is also holomorphic. So this implies that F is holomorphic. And now what we want to do is to compute the um, derivative of uh, F. And to do, to, do, do, to do this, we use the following fact. So uh, we use the identity that F tilde times G tilde, where F tilde and G tilde are holomorphic functions. If I take now the derivative of this function and I divide by F tilde times G tilde, this is F tilde prime over F tilde plus G tilde prime over G tilde. Now this is for all 
F tilde, G tilde holomorphic, and obviously different from zero. So this is um, this identity. You will show it in the exercise, and uh, let's see how we, we can use then this identity to get the desired formula for um, the derivative of f prime. So then we want to do f prime divided by f, but this is now the derivative of the product from zero to n zero minus one of g n times e to the h, so this derivative over the same function. And now we can use the identity we found uh, several times. So here we have not only a product of two functions, but these are n0 plus one uh, functions. And we get the sum from zero to n0 minus one of gn prime over gn plus the derivative of e to the h divided by e to the h. Okay, but what is the derivative of e to the h? e to the h prime divided by e to the h. So above we have e to the h times h prime divided by e to the h. And this is, e, uh, this is h prime. But h prime, we saw before what was h prime. h prime, you see it here. This is this uh, infinite sum. So this implies that here we get sum from n going to 0 to n0 minus 1 of gn prime over gn plus the infinite sum from n0 to infinity of gn prime over gn. And this gives us the formula for f prime over f. And uh, what we were saying uh, before about the zeros is also um, easy to see. Uh, the last thing is that the zeros of f inside this uh, compact set, these are the union of the zeros of gn of gn uh, from, n, uh, from 0 to n0 minus 1 intersected with k because the last uh, function that we get e to the h uh, is never vanishing. Okay, and now uh, since k is arbitrary, we get the arbitrary, we get the statement. Of theorem. Very good. So this is uh, our main uh, theorem. And as we did for infinite series, now we want to give a criterion for the convergence on um, uh, convergence uniformly on compact sets. So now we want to give a criterion uh, for uniform convergence. Uh, let me write it uh, explicitly for uniform convergence, convergence on compact sets for uh, infinite products. In the case of infinite series, we saw we had the virus trust M test. This is very useful criterion. In this case also, the, the criterion we will give will be derived from virus trust M test. And it will be given this uh, lemma. So, Suppose we have, uh, as always, this uh, series of holomorphic on U, and then these are not identically zero. And now let's define 
Hn, which is Gn minus one. So what we do, we suppose that uh, this sequence now uh, satisfies uh, the M test. What does it mean? It means that for all K in U, you can find some number N1 big or equal than zero and a convergent series of positive numbers Rn, so Rn goes from n goes from n1 to infinity, such that um, for all n bigger or equal than n1, the supremum for z in k of hn of z is less or equal than Rn. Then if this holds, um, we can say that uh, uh, the infinite product of all the GNs converges uniformly on compact sets. So this is what, what we want to prove. So basically we are back to the uh, M test for uh, series, but instead of taking GN, we have to consider Hn, which is Gn minus one. So this is some sense natural because for infinite series, what we want to have convergence is that the, um, the, the terms converge to zero in a very fast way so, so that the, the sum is convergent. In the case of a product, in order to have convergence of an infinite product, the terms don't have to converge to zero, but they have to converge to one, no? because one is the neutral element of the multiplication. So if you want to have convergence, you want to have uh, that the general term of this sequence converges to one. And then uh, how fast this, this term has, has to converge to one, you can measure by looking at Hn, which is Gn minus one. And then what this lemma says is that if this Hn uh, it's converging to zero uh, in a very fast way, the, in a way that the M test is satisfied, then you have convergence for the infinite product. Okay, so let's prove uh, uh, the lemma. So what we want to do, we want to prove the uh, uh, convergence. So for this, we, what we have to do, we fix a compact set and choose now uh, n0 big, uh, big or equal than n1 such that for all n big or equal than n0 rn is less or equal than one half. So this can always be done because rn uh, is an element of a convergent series so um, for n big must be uh, less or equal than one half then this implies that for all z in k, g n z minus one, this is uh, equal to the norm of h and z, this must be less or equal than one half. Okay, so the the point G and Z is a distance at most one half from um, one. So this means exactly that G and K is contained in a disk of radius one half and center one. So if here is the origin, here is the point one, then we are inside this disk. So this is the one half one close. So here inside you will have the point 
GNZ. And now what we are going to do is to use um, the Taylor expansion of the logarithm inside the disk, inside the disk D1 of one. Okay. Because now you see this disk is contained in the in, in domain of the logarithm. So we can use now the first property, first of all, the first property um, in, the, in the definition of convergence on compact sets is uh, satisfied. So you see the first property was that GN K is contained in the domain of the logarithm. And then now we have to check the second property. To check the second property, now we will use the Taylor expansion of the logarithm. So since the logarithm of one is equal to zero, there exists some C bigger than zero such that the norm of the logarithm of W is less or equal than C times W minus one for all W belonging to this disk. Okay, so this is uh, just by taking uh, um, the um, Taylor expansion to uh, the, first, uh, the first order, uh, because what you know is that the logarithm of W will be equal to the logarithm of one plus uh, some um, coefficient A1 times W minus uh, one plus A2 times W minus one squared and so on. But the first, this first coefficient here, this will be zero. And then you see that the logarithm of W uh, is uh, uh, of order at least one in W minus one. So you have then the existence of the constant uh, C. Okay, very good. So uh, now we have this, uh, this property. And using this property, we can show the convergence of the uh, series uh, of the logarithm. So now the logarithm of GN this is less or equal than C times GN minus one. And uh, you see gen minus one, this is nothing else than uh, the norm of HN. And by a hypothesis, we know that the norm of HN here is bound by RN. So we get here the estimate less or equal than, let's call this maybe uh, RN tilde which is C times Rn. So uh, by the M test uh, with respect convergent series sum of Rn tilde, uh, we see that we see that uh, this sum and going to from n uh, zero to infinity is uniformly convergent on k. Very good. So this is uh, uh, this shows that uh, also the second uh, property of uh, uniform convergence on compact set is satisfied. So this shows that the infinite uh, product converges uniformly on compact sets, and we are done. 
No? So remember, converging uniform and compact sets means these two properties that we highlighted um, above here. And we have both of them. So we showed uh, both of them. Very good. So this is now uh, the end of the uh, theoretical part. And, then, and now let's apply all this uh, machinery to some interesting examples. So the first example will give us a product representation of the sine function. More precisely, of the sine function sines of pi z. So sinus of pi z is, um, is a function with zeros um, in the integers. So every integer is a, is a zero. And now we consider a, an infinite product with the same properties. So consider f of z, which is z times the product from one to infinity of one minus z squared over n squared. And so here we can call the, this z, we can call it g0. And the function here, we can call it gn. Then let's check that uh, these uh, infinite products converges uniformly on compact set. So what is hn? So we want to use the the lemma, then hn is gn minus one. And you see this is minus z squared over n squared. So now if we, if we take um, a disk of radius r and center zero, then h n z will be less or equal than the uh, norm of minus z squared over n squared. And uh, uh, this is um, uh, less or equal, sorry, this is an equality, the first one, this is less or equal than r squared over n squared. And this is our um, sequence Rn, and this holds obviously for all n bigger or equal than um, the first one, one which you can <clears throat> you can think of uh, n one. And now you see that uh, sum of R n from n going from one to infinity uh, is uh, less than plus infinity. And uh, uh, this implies um, by the lemma that uh, the product Gn converges uniformly on compact sets. So by the theorem, thus uh, by theorem, F is holomorphic and we have the formula for F prime over F. So what is the formula of F prime over F? Recall this is the sum for N going from zero to infinity of GN prime over GN. So for the case of N equal to zero, we get one over Z. For the other cases, we get uh, from one on, we get uh, Gn prime and uh, Gn prime is minus two z over n squared. And then we divide this by one minus z squared over n squared. Okay, so if we rewrite this, you see this is a, um, a series that we encountered in the last lecture. This is uh, two z over z squared minus n squared. So this is pi times the cotangent of pi z. 
And now the crucial observation is that this function can also be written as uh, uh, the derivative of a function over a function. So this is, you take sinus of pi z, you take the derivative and you divide by sinus of pi z. This gives you pi times the cotangent of pi z. And now you see you have this equality. So f prime over f is equal to sinus of pi z prime over sinus of pi z. And this tells you that f prime, uh, sorry, f divided by sinus of pi z prime is equal to zero. You can check this and you will do it actually in the exercises. So this means that this function is constant. So there exists some C in the complex uh, numbers such that F of Z is equal to C times sinus of pi Z. So now we want to find the C. How we do this? To do this, it's um, convenient to look at the uh, limit of F Z over Z for Z going to zero. So on one hand, this is also C times the limit Z going to zero of sinus of pi Z over Z. And this we know what it is, is C times pi. On the other hand, we can go back to, to look at the, um, at the formula for F. And then when we divide by Z, we get here we get here the limit that point to zero of the product and going um, from uh, Z, so from one to infinity of one minus Z squared over N squared. Okay, but this function now is uh, continuous in z equal to zero. So this is just the product for n going from one to infinity of one minus z squared over n squared. So we see we are taking an infinite product of ones. So this is done uh, giving me uh, the number one. So if we read off what we found, c is one over Okay, so very, very good. So we proved the following uh, theorem, namely that sinus of pi z over pi, this is z times the product for n going from one to infinity of one minus z squared over n squared. Okay, so this we just proved. And if you use this theorem, you get a very nice formula for the number pi, and this is called Wallis formula from the guy who uh, discovered it. And uh, the formula says that pi over two is the in an infinite product and going from one to infinity of two n over two n minus one times two n over two n plus one. So if you want to uh, spell this out, uh, you start two over one times two over three. Then you go on above with the even numbers and below you see with the odd numbers. And so on. So you see every time you get twice uh, above uh, an even number and twice below this, the, um, the odd numbers. Very good. So also this, you will see it as, a, as an exercise. And now I want to uh, give as a next example, uh, a product representation for the Riemann's uh, zeta function. So we saw that this can be represented as a, um, a series of uh, holomorphic functions but it's a very nice result uh, due to Euler that uh, this function can also be represented as an infinite product of holomorphic functions. 
So this is then the next example that we want to discuss, the product representation of the function zeta. And this is given by uh, theorem of Euler, which says that uh, if we consider the sequence of prime numbers, which we take in increasing order. So this means that the first prime number P1 is two, the second prime, prime number is three, third is five and so on. So in particular, you see that Pn is bigger or equal than N for all N bigger or equal than one. So if uh, you consider this sequence, then you have uh, um, the following uh, formula that one over the zeta function in Z is equal to the infinite product one to infinity of the functions one minus one over Pn to the Z. So in order to prove this theorem, we'll first um, make sure that the infinite product is well defined. And by the, for this reason, we will uh, use the lemma. And then we will, we will prove uh, actually uh, the equality here. So let me uh, do the rules, so we want to apply the lemma. So um, the sequence of functions Gn is the, are the functions one minus one over Pn Z and Hn is therefore the function minus one over Pn to the Z. Okay, so these are uh, um, um, right, the functions we are want to consider. So this is for n uh, bigger or equal uh, than one. So now we want to show the convergence. Um, we will show the convergence uh, for every a bigger than one and z in c such that the real part of z is bigger or equal than a. So if you recall where the, where the, um, the function zeta was uh, converging uniformly, this is exactly um, this, um, this condition that also was appearing there. So <clears throat> under this condition, you can see that Hn of z is then less or equal in norm to um, one over Pn to the a. Okay, so here this inequality, we already basically proved it uh, in the last lecture when we introduced uh, zeta. So I don't uh, say much uh, more about it. And this is one over n to the a. No, because we know that pn is bigger or equal than n. Right, and this uh, series now is uh, convergent. So uh, sum of rn from n from one to infinity is convergent. This implies by the lemma that the product this here converges converges uh, on compact sets. Uh, in uh, which um, region, the region where Z has a real part bigger than one, uh, which we call this just the, re the union for A bigger or equal than one of these regions. Okay, so the two products, so the, this, this infinite product then is defined exactly in the domain of definition of zeta. And now let's show 
that um, um, this equality here hold. What we are going to do is uh, we are going to multiply zeta by the first of the factors. So the first of the factors is one minus one over two to the z. So two is the first prime number. What do we get if we do this uh, multiplication? So recall zeta was defined as the sum for n going from one um, to infinity of one over n to the z times one minus one over two to the z. So let me write explicitly the sum. So the sum is uh, one plus one over two to the z, one over three to the z, one over four to the z, and so on. And then we have to multiply this by one minus one over two to the z. So since the series is uh, convergent, we can do this uh, multiplication term by term. So if we multiply now, let's see, if we multiply now by one, so let's use another color for one, we use um, red and for one over two to the z, let's use green. Then we multi when we multiply by one, we get uh, the red terms, so one, plus one over two to the z, plus one over three to the z, plus one over four to the z, and so on. And now when we multiply by minus one over two to the z, what we get? So we start getting one over two to the z, minus one over four to the z, minus one over six to the z, and so on. So you see all the numbers we get here are divisible by two. And we get exactly uh, each of them once. So when we, what we are doing, we are taking uh, one and then we are getting rid of all the uh, numbers which are divisible by two. So here, this goes away with this, this goes away with this. So only the numbers which are not divisible by two survive. So we can write this as one plus the sum over n not divisible by two of one over n to the z. Okay, so this was the first passage. We can multiply the function by another of the uh, factors. So now we multiply the ready by one over by one minus one over two to the z. Now we can multiply by the second factor. Second prime number is three. And what do we get? So uh, we already know that we, then we, when we multiply now the first two, the first two we get uh, one plus one over three to the z plus one over five to the z and so on. So these are the numbers which are not divisible by two. And now you get here um, times one minus one over three to the z. So now as before, we get first uh, the series as we know it. But now we get also minus one over three to the z minus one over nine to the z and so on. So, so here you see we are, uh, we are uh, subtracting all numbers which are divisible by three, but also uh, not divisible by two. This we already uh, got rid of them. So the end effect is that what we have is one plus the sum over n not divided by two or by three. So this is what we what we get now. So now we, we did the first two cases. So what what will happen in in general is that um, zeta 
z times the product for uh, for l going from one to um, n one minus one over p l z. This will be uh, one plus the sum of, um, let's say, k. Or maybe let's use here another letter. So let, let's use here k. And now these are n, which are not divisible by p1 up to pk, 1 over n to the z. So this implies that what is the reminder uh, that we get from uh, 1. So we take this product. Minus 1. So this product here is uh, less or equal than uh, the sum of 1 over n to the a, where uh, n not divisible by p1 pk. And uh, this n must be, therefore, bigger or equal than pk, and therefore bigger or equal than k. So this implies that this is less or equal than the sum from k to infinity of 1 over n to the a. Now, so here we used that um, this n must be bigger or equal than pk, which is bigger or equal than k. Okay, and then now we, uh, we found here that this is uh, converging to zero as k converges to infinity. So we have the uh, convergence. So uh, this implies that theta of z times the infinite product is equal to one, which is exactly what we wanted uh, to prove. Okay, so this is a, a very nice, uh, very nice example. And also here you see how this function zeta has something to do with number theory, because we have, for example, this Euler um, description here as an infinite product. So um, now I want to present a last example, which is very uh, important and also bears the name of Euler. So this last example is the Euler gamma function. So in this example, um, let, con let me consider the following sequence. A sequence of uh, holomorphic functions. So these are defined on the, on the old C and goes now from zero to infinity, holomorphic, uh, where what is uh, Gn? So the first two, I have to define them by hand. G0 is Z, G1 is Z plus one. And after this, for all n big or equal than two, I define Gn of Z as one plus Z over n times one minus one over n to the z. So now what I want to show is that uh, the infinite product converges. So proposition is infinite product converges uniformly on compact sets. And here we will see that uh, for the proof, 
the lemma is uh, not enough. So we have to use a similar idea, um, but we have to refine it a bit. So in the lemma, re recall, we used uh, the Taylor expansion of the logarithm to the first order. And now we want to go uh, one order higher. So we know that the logarithm at one is equal to zero. And now we also use the fact that the derivative of the logarithm at one is equal to one. So this implies that there exists some constant C such that the logarithm of W minus W minus one. So this is the first um, um, the Taylor expansion of the first order less or equal than C times W minus one squared. And this holds uh, for all W in uh, this disk that we saw also in the proof of the, in the proof of the lemma. So now let, let me see how we can use uh, this to uh, uh, conclude. So what we want to do is to show the uniform convergence. So we want now to take some compact set. And as a compact set, we take now some positive integer and consider the disk with radius k and center zero. So we have to uh, now uh, take, we have to take um, n zero. So we take n zero equal to two k. Then for n bigger or equal than n zero and z in this disk, what do we have is that uh, the first thing is that gn of, of the disk must be contained in, um, in, the, um, in the domain of the logarithm. So, But what, what do we have here? So GN, um, uh, yes, so GN of Z must be contained in C must be contained in C minus minus infinity zero. And uh, um, to show this, let's observe that one, what do we have to observe now? So let's take, uh, uh, let's take uh, uh, now one plus z over n times one minus one over n to the, uh, to the z. So here you see that um, um, what do we know that Z to the N in norm is less or equal than K over N. And so this is uh, less or equal than one half. So this implies that one plus Z over N is contained in uh, the disk one half one bar. And the other thing now we want to show that uh, the same applies for uh, one minus one over N to the Z. So this recall, this is the number E to the Z times the logarithm 
uh, of uh, of n and uh, here you see if um, uh, if um, if uh, what we are want to do um, we want to show that this is in the uh, in the disk so um, what we want to show is that this number is close uh, to uh, one so this implies that e to the z times log of n minus one this here is um, actually equal to um, e to the real part of z times log n minus uh, times e to the imaginary part of z times log n minus one times i and um, what we can um, what we can do now so sorry this is not logarithm of n no? so is logarithm of one minus one over n yeah so this is much now much better And uh, um, right, so um, you're not at the moment, I don't see how how to do this. So I will maybe uh, stop the recording here.